all yours. Thanks. Good afternoon to everyone who's joined us and welcome to our first edition of what we're hoping is going to be a bi-weekly video blog, Think Like an Explorer. It is co-hosted by myself and my Dovadi, and the intention is to talk about a topic of interest from the world of adventure, but bringing it back to real life and where relevant uh, to business as well. Both Nigel and I, among other things, are motivational speakers who bring lessons lessons of life, uh, lessons of projects and teams and achievement and failure learnt in wild and remote places and then bring them back to a wider world. So let me start by introducing myself briefly. Then Nigel will give you some background on who he is and we'll go into our topic for today. I'm Cathy O'Dowd. I'm best known as the first woman to have climbed Everest from both sides. I have, in fact, been climbing mountains since I was 18, which is at least a quarter of a century ago. Still climbing, still passionate, and fascinated not so much by standing on top of things, although that's quite fun, but by the process of being out there and what it is that you discover about yourself and about what you can achieve and about who you want to be achieving it with when you're out on the mountain. So, Nigel. What are you bringing to our video blog? Well, like yourself, Cathy, um, I'm a mountaineer. I can't say I've climbed Everest like you have, but I've had a few uh, big mountains under my belt. I'm probably best known for being airlifted off most of them, actually. Um, <laughs> the simplest way of saying it is that. That's what cameras are all about, that severe frostbite. Uh, and I think like yourself, Cathy, as well, it's not always standing on the summit, the summit that's the big thing. It's things like the experience being there, what you learn and understand about yourself and other people and how you can bring those lessons home. Like yourself, been climbing 25 odd years and still at it. Our third face is Cindy Michelle from IWantToSpeaker.com and she's joining us basically to do the wrangling. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quiet most of the time. <laughs> so that we can interact as effectively as possible with comments and questions running on the side while still actually managing to have an intelligent discussion between Nigel and I about the topic of the day. Okay. And today's topic is one that is all over the news. It popped up first in The Guardian last week. It's the Nepalese government saying that they are going to introduce more regulations, new regulations, to limit novices on Everest. And this is one of these things that sounds like perfectly sensible when it's like one line, but when you dig into it, it turns out to be quite complicated for a whole set of reasons. So I want to talk very briefly about kind of some of their obvious limitations and then go into the, the most interesting one, the complicated one, which is really is what is a novice. Mm. But what they've said is first of all age limits. Nobody under 18, nobody over 75. Now both the records are well beyond that on both sides. The oldest climber from Japan was 80. He had climbed Everest at least twice already, hardly a novice. But then on the other hand he had an enormous amount of Sherpa support, oxygen support and got helicopter lifted off from Camp 2 on the way down. So is it ageist? Isn't it? I don't know. It's just such a tiny, tiny group of people. I don't think it's the most important part of the debate. The young age one, that's perhaps more interesting. The age record of them is 13. Youngest girl, 13 year old uh, from India. Youngest boy, 13 year old from the USA. And there's a nice young chap who's 11. And he's got his hand up to go on to Everest next spring to break the age record. Uh, China brought in an age restriction in response to, uh, I think his name's Tyler. And Nepal and I were saying no under 18s. Yeah, I got to say, much as I'm in favor of, I like mountaineering because you do get to do your thing to take risks and live with consequences. 
But when you're 11, do you actually know what risk is really about? What do you think, Nigel? It's so, so, so for you, for you. When I, when I, I, I can't imagine I, myself wanting to climb a mountain like Everest. Um, and, and I've worked in engineering a long time, and we talk about having apprenticeships where people learn, and then from that learning, they take that experience further. But from my side also, we're talking about disability. It's very obvious what's happened to me uh, with my frostbite. But, you know, do we want people to, to go on to Everest with major disabled, uh, you know, losing fingers, thumbs, legs? Um, we've got Nobukazu Karuki, who's uh, lost, I think it's eight fingers now, and he's had a crack at it. Um, I think he's come off this year. But again, he's lost eight fingers on the mountain. We've got people who have been blind, want to get to the top of Everest. Amputees, that's been a big one, certainly um since certainly help for heroes in britain and many other places across the world you know should people be going up with multiple amputees and massive sherpa support has it been is what i'd ask but then if you take the two most famous disabled climbers, well, first of all, we've got the Japanese guy who's up there at yeah. the moment and he is trying again. Is he trying again, is he? Right, and okay. Let's just, you know, talk about the fact that he is solo, utterly solo. He had mm -hmm. Sherpas to set trail to Camp 2. Above Camp 2, he is utterly solo, breaking his own trail, carrying his own kit, and mm -hmm. no oxygen. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, the, for what would be considered the, the cleanest form of climbing Everest. If the gold standard is Reinhold Messner yeah. back in 1978, you... Right, you certainly, yeah, without oh, oxygen, no, as you say. No oxygen. Uh, our Japanese guy is, you know, setting the standard we should be aspiring to. Yeah. Who, who are we to call him disabled because... They lost eight fingers. He well, Kathy, I mean, this is the entire thing. As you've tried to say, define a novice. How do you define a disability? You know, you can have somebody who's blind, who's perfectly fit and able. I, I have no toes. I still climb not to uh, extreme routes, but some pretty technical routes. I think the biggest thing is understanding your limitations. You know, if uh, nobody wants to get up there and do this clean ascent, uh, and he's got experience up there and he thinks he can do it that's one thing but if it purely is a stunt for the want of a word now that is something else well it's okay so i think we've got two edges that are uh reasonably well defined as in the one is uh it's a pure stunt the other edge is someone like our japanese climber right now who i think has absolutely every right to be up there some of the most famous disabled were good climbers mm -hmm. and they uh mark engels uh double amputee mm -hmm. a professional climber yeah and he, he lost his legs below the knee on mount cook oh, yeah. Uh, yeah eric weimar the blind climber again yeah. a remarkably talented climber yeah maybe the question is how much risk are you passing on to other people if you're having to be basically escorted up and escorted down. Well, I don't know if you've seen some of the Twitter feeds coming out of the story as it was announced, but we've had everything from why don't you just lay a Via Ferrata from base camp to the summit and have it done with. Um, we know that ropes are laid from basically the Cumbo Icefall to the top. And yeah. then we've had the issue, uh, was it last year, the year before, with Steck and the others doing uh, trying to do a solo without oxygen ascent and obviously the issues that came from that. Um, it's where you draw the line. I just can't understand 8,848 metres being the second only mountain you've ever climbed. Regardless of rope from the bottom to the top, you know, this is a very serious place to go. Yes, I think that's possibly the real downfall of the, the meat of this proposal, which is actually not the age limits and, uh, and the disability. It's saying you've got to have done one mountain over six and a half thousand metres. But the trouble is Aconcagua, which is one of the seven summits, is virtually 7,000 metres and you can more or less go up it in trainers. There's yeah. a small snow patch near the top. I mean, yeah. not to say that Aconcagua won't kill you in bad weather. It will. 
Aconcagua can be a thoroughly serious mountain. And the south face of Aconcagua has been called two north face of the Iger stacked on top of each other. Yeah. But yeah. the standard route on Aconcagua in a reasonable window of good weather in the season, you can do in trainers. What has that taught you about what you need on Everest? Nothing at all, I don't think, except for how do you breathe at six, eight, six, nine. Uh, you've got away from all the things that we have to know of organization, preparation, weather forecasting, food, equipment, team, how you work together. I mean, the list goes on, as you know well. And if you're being basically mothered, manhandled, whatever you wish to call it, from bottom to top, your camps are being built, your food's being taken up, your equipment's being laid out. You know, is it really a climb, even if it was 4,000 metres doing that? That's the, that's the question. Um, I, I'd rather think, I don't expect everybody to go up without oxygen and push up new routes all the time, but we might say, great, go and do a 6,500 metre peak. I've got Aconcagua, wonderful, man, magnificent. But have you done any alpine climbing? Have you worked with ropes? Have you done, yeah, you know, rock climbing at your local crag when you were younger? Have you got a bit of background so when it does it, the fan, and it will, you know what to do? Yes, I think maybe a valid question. Of course, this is theoretical because there's a different issue about how Nepal actually tests any of this. I mean, even if they came up with a more rigorous uh, qualific resume, mm. it's incredibly hard to prove whether you have or haven't done the mountains you claim you have. Yeah. It's just sticking for a moment with the sort of the theoretical uh, side of it. Maybe the question to ask is, could you get yourself down alone? Not with a 100% guarantee, because the best climber in the world can, can die in bad circumstances. Yeah. But if the people around you were all in trouble for some reason or dead, could you have a reasonable shot at getting yourself back down the mountain to get for help or to save your own life. Yeah. And yeah. I think that there are, you know, there are a lot of the clients who could realistically say that, no, they couldn't. No, I think that's a huge, huge question there, Kathy, because as, as we know, well, you know, things go wrong. And, and as I've had twice, I've had to turn around from two mountains and take the conscious decision of this is far enough. And I've had to actually turn around at times in tears and say, that's it, this is my day and I need to go down. And I can only take that judgment by the background that I've had in climbing because one very nearly cost me frostbite again. And it would have been so easy just to say, I'm fine, it's not an issue, I'll just keep going, it's not a problem. But I actually sat down and said, no, this is enough, Nigel, it's not your day. But that hadn't cost me 30 or 40,000 pounds and it hadn't cost me two or three months of my life and there's an old phrase in Japan of there are no morals over 8,000 meters now that's just something I've read I've never been to 8,000 meters but as you say do you know I know it's only half an hour to the summit but it's going to cost me or as you say Kathy everybody else is in trouble can I get myself down and anybody else who's in trouble if that's viable and that will set a lot of people apart from a lot of other people on the hill. And yet, if you take that, then every client has basically outsourced that experience, that decades of experience, and therefore those key decisions to a guide. But I don't think we're objecting to guiding in the Alps. Why is guiding on Everest any different from being guided in the Alps? I mean, people die with frightening regularity on mountains in the Alps. It's oh, yeah. just an thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right because there are a myriad of companies who will guide in any other part of the Himalayas, the Andes, uh, Africa, you know, the Alps. There's plenty of guiding going on. Um, I, think, I think some people, I don't know, Everest pulls column inches. We've had, uh, when I was out there last year, all the avalanches, we've had the earthquakes of this year and it's very very big in the press this is where i go back to branding because if something horrible had happened miles away in a mountain nobody had ever really heard of it would not have the same effect on the media because it's hit everest and there's miles of youtube footage and it's reported 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 it will draw these questions 
and and this is where i go back to it is a mountain but is it also becoming a brand and are people having this thing as, as i've got to climb it you've only got to look at most people's bucket lists and somebody somewhere will put climb mount everest on it you know is that is that getting away from we can be purists and say is that getting away from being a mountaineer <laughs> people have this drive and i work in in schools where the first thing i will be asked every time is have you climbed everest and yet we're trying to get kids you know off their backsides from the out from the video games and out into the wilderness you know if everest is a mountain they've heard of and if the thought of getting to the top of a mountain makes some sense to them yeah absolutely I don't know where you go with this there's a the other thing that we perhaps ought to acknowledge is this is a media storm in a teacup okay. for a couple of reasons firstly the nepalese government has a record of making pronouncements and then not acting on them yeah. so it's quite possible that none of this would actually ever be implemented uh there's a particularly uh good analysis i posted a link by alan onet about some of the background to this and of course a lot of this isn't actually about is any particular climber good enough or not good enough it's about the money yeah it's heavily financially driven and it's driven on two levels it's driven by the guides the guiding companies and not these are not just fancy western guiding companies there are now a lot of uh, nepalese run guiding companies yeah. who are often making it by heavily undercutting the western companies on price and so none of them are keen on being told you know our clients have to have met a whole set of fancy criteria mm. Mm. the other problem is the the permit money into the government uh, nepal is well nepal is desperately poor and everest is a big money earner yeah I whether see. they're actually going to do anything that limits how much they bring in from permit fees uh seems unlikely and and just the amount of infrastructure as you know well in the kumbu kathy it it's gone when i read books of the 50s and 60s even up to the 80s this was somewhere where very few people went and now you know you've got flight after flight after flight in there i hear they want to push the road further in towards lukla and um, anybody that's woken up in namchi bazaar in the morning will know the dust cloud that goes out of hundreds of thousands it seems like anyway but thousands of people are go trekking to look at everest and and this huge city opens up on north and south um so it's not you know the permit fees are huge the press is huge but it almost runs the local economy it gives a lot of people work and a lot of people who won't you know they want our company's got the youngest person on everest our, P, our P, uh, company's got the most disabled person on the summit you know it all makes strap lines for them yes i mean we think we almost live in an age where the the obvious first to be done the first person to climb everest that kind of thing yeah the true cutting edge of climbing now is astonishingly difficult I mean, it, it's incredibly impressive but it's really quite hard to explain it doesn't come with easy taglines any longer yeah. and unless you're almost in climbing yourself and quite deep in it's hard to understand why certain things are just so breathtakingly impressive so people the media and remember commercial sponsorship for these big mountains you're normally being supported by media coverage yeah they're after records and it's easier to explain you know the first pair of twins to stand on the summit of everest or the first couple to get married on the summit of everest or whatever it is yeah. it's easier to explain that than it is to first to be good enough to be doing world class uh, yeah. record setting and then explain those records to anyone who isn't a climber i agree with you completely kathy because i was recently at a lecture um with a guy called leo holding speaking doing an immense route in greenland up a huge vertical wall and as a climber it's an absolute you know you look up at this thing and it's a huge huge tower but trying to explain that to anybody out of climbing as you say it's just not going to pull the same as i've been up everest it it doesn't have that draw that dream that sort of misty image that people have had built up you know from the 20s and before and now coming into the modern world um where one of the major reasons perhaps we knew so much about the earthquake at base camp was the amount of film crews that were there and the amount of IT uh, getting messages out via sat phones and all the rest of it you know we were seeing 
pictures within minutes in, and videos within hours or days of this thing. You know, very few places in the world where you have a natural disaster quite remotely will you get anything like that within days, if not even weeks. And you know, it really shows up what an enterprise it's actually become. Yes, another interesting example I came across was back in 2012. Uh, I was on a team with two top British mountaineers, Sandy Allen and Rick Allen. Mm -hmm. And they ended up doing the first ascent of Nanga Parbat via the Mazena Ridge. They won a Piolet to Awe for that. It was considered one of the most important ascents in the Himalaya in 2012. And so two British climbers who pulled this thing off. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Kenton Cool, and Kenton is a superb climber. Yes, yes. I'm not, not, not saying anything against that, but at the time Kenton was guiding on Everest and he took a, an Olympic medal from some chap back in 1924 right. and he carried it to the summit of Everest on the standard route in the queue while guiding his clients and he's done Everest a number of times before. That got far more media coverage yeah. in Britain yeah. than Rick and Sandy on the Mazeno Ridge did. Absolutely. The one was cutting edge mountaineering and the other one was just one more guy in a queue of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people on the standard route of Everest. Yeah, yeah. It, the medal was from the 1920s. It was when uh, mountaineering was apparently an Olympic sport. That would be an interesting one. <laughs> yes. It was issued by a member of the Strutt family who built the town that I live in, actually. Um, but on, on a similar one, I know, and, and I know Kenton quite well as yourself, you know, he did the first 3G message, I think, from the summit as well. And, you know, as you say, nothing against Kenton. He is a super mountaineer and a really nice bloke to know. But but what are we proving? You know, what are we proving here? Um, as you say, um, the Manzino Ridge, oh, just having watched your pictures, you know, unbelievable cutting edge mountaineering. But that's getting back into your climbing people again, such as, I don't know, somebody who did an incredible single handed sail around the world or somebody who dived to the biggest depths. If it doesn't hit the media at the right moment in the right time on the right day, it will get minimal coverage. But because, you know, we, we get a big thing on Everest or we get the media rolling with us before we go. So I'm going to go and do this. And here's what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to achieve. Are you all with me? Boom. And it's just like a tidal wave hitting the side of the mountain. Yeah, I think the trouble with this is we, it's just too easy to wag fingers. But actually, our entire culture is part of this. Mm. You know, coming back to... Uh, our solo Japanese climber who's up there right now somewhere probably knee deep in snow at 8,000 meters alone without oxygen, carrying all his own kit. That's a particular remarkable thing to be trying to do. And he's got some serious experience. Yeah. No one's paying any attention. I mean, I, I hope they are in Japan, but they aren't in sort of international media. No, not at all. Not at all. I think after the, um, you know, the traffic, traffic avalanches earlier in the year and all the other stuff, I think looking at the media as I do, Everest has had a big soak of media attention. And it's like so many unfortunate things. We all see the avalanche debris. We see the earthquake debris in, in Nepal. It's tragic. People do lots of fundraisers and it dies away from the media because something else happens and something else happens and something else happens. Um, and, and it's the classic media thing. Um, you know, you have your five minutes and then we're away and we're on to another subject somewhere else in the world doing something else. And I think that's how the media runs. I mean, they need column inches. They need new stories. Occasionally, they'll go back to it, you know, in six months. What's Nepal like now? In a year, what's Nepal like now? Um, but otherwise, you know, times move on. Yes, my guess will be that nothing changes. There may be an age limits at either end. And they might even bring in the one six and a half thousand meter mountain. But given that there's no way of checking. Yeah actually because the whole beauty of climbing is that it is so independent a great many of these things you just wander off and do them and you come back and tell some friends and we take it on trust that yeah. you did what you said you did yes yes and you have some lovely photographs hopefully and a wonderful experience uh, and you move on to the next peak if that's exactly what you want to do I think the closest we may come is the age limits because having some 11 year old die on top of Everett would yeah. be negative press probably. And that's it. And 
we may get a whole lot of new climbers who I mean, the funny thing about the 1996 disaster, uh, and I was on the mountain at the time, and that produced the famous book by John Krakauer, Into Thin Air, which was basically a massive critique of guided climbing mm -hmm. in the face of a huge disaster where five climbers died in the storm. And, you know, that's the subject of that uh, Hollywood movie that's out, Everest. All of that, all of that, you'd think it would put people off. No. What it did was open the gates to the new era of commercial climbing because a whole lot of people read that book and went, oh, hey, I didn't know this was a thing I could do. Where do I sign up? Kathy, you've only got to imagine uh, you know, way in the past uh, when, the, when the Great War broke out, people would fake their age to join up. And, and OK, they hadn't heard the awful stories of the trenches by then, but 13 and 14 year old boys were lying about their age to go to the front because they thought it was a great adventure. And that's the thing. It's a great adventure. We can check your age. We can get your passport, uh, you know, and we can say yes or no. How you define disabled, of course, is a completely different world. Do you say above the knee amputations, below the knee, one arm, no arm? I mean, it would be unbelievable. And of course, the other issue, and, I, and I, I never want this to happen, but I'll bring it up, is if you say to somebody, you're too disabled, you're not allowed to go up, and we end up with a court case. I really hope that nobody has the audacity to say, I want to go up, I know what I'm doing, I've got years of experience or not, I want to do this and I will do it. How are you going to stop me? Because that's going to be another issue. Oh, well, good luck taking, you know, a court case into Nepal. Oh, yeah. Red tape, you will die first. Before <laughs> <laughs> well, the mean, this, this is the attitude that the West will have. Uh, I'm not sure that you can go there. Yes, I think the great adventure, there's, there's no stopping that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What we're possibly losing, though, is the sense that people want the great adventure as in that, yes, I too conquered because everyone conquers oh. now. Apparently, I conquered Everest, but they want it as easy as possible. Yes. So they want to have conquered without actually having to do any of the work of sort of traditional conquering. Yeah. Uh, Alan Onet brings that up in his article again, talking about uh, for the those who want to pay for it, there's now the sort of the quick fix option: fly you into base camp so you don't have to do the walk in. Obviously, you've pre-acclimatized with one of those gamma bag, you know things yeah. then guaranteed two sherpas so part of the crowding on the mountain isn't just the number of foreigners it's now that every foreigner require you know well uh certain of the foreigners are being promised two sherpas to maximize the chance of getting into the top plus the western guide plus yeah. put them on oxygen you know from sort of six and a half thousand meters yeah. uh, that's your kind of oil executives fly in fly out summit of everest guaranteed packet yeah, yeah. And, and not just that, Cathy. I mean, the amount of material that has to go up there. So, as you say, one client, one guide, two climbing Sherpas, plus everything else to build, you know, the camps to get up there, the supplies, the oxygen to get up there. Um, you, you, and this is where I suppose some of the Twitter feeds are coming up with, you know, why don't you just build a Via Ferrata? Um, when I was talking with George Lowe from the 53 expedition some years ago, they were being asked about whether the mounting could be sort of reenacted in the 53 style. And as he said, I don't see how you can do it. We had one or two wooden poles and a ladder to get over the ice fall. There are now something like 50 ladders. Um, just the sheer weight of numbers and the narrowness of the route, perhaps, you know, do you want more fixed lines? I read a story today about putting ladders on the Hillary step. I don't know if you saw that. Um, just purely for numbers and speed. Well, that was a previous proposition of the Nepalese government, which nothing has happened, which was to, to put up a put up two ladders, an up ladder and a down ladder, uh, to try and. <laughs> well, I think we've got to be able to say, probably nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's wrap it up on one thought, because what I think is so easily forgotten when Everest is reduced to this massive queue of, of punters, of novices, and then all the sort of scathing attitudes that come from both media and other climbers and the general public towards that idea. Everest is so much more than that. 
there are, okay, I'm not going to have the figures quite right. There are about 15 routes on Everest, ways of climbing it, some of which have not had a second descent. They are just that difficult. There are three seasons you can climb in. Don't be in the queue. You can join our brave Japanese guy right now and be the only man on Everest on yeah. either side. Uh, or you can go in winter, which is even worse. But the you know, winter climbing of 8,000 meter peaks is a thing. <laughs> I'm not signing up, but it's a thing. <laughs> and finally, there are at least two routes on Everest that have never been climbed. They are so hard mm. that they can't be done by our generation. One is the Fantasy Ridge, which has been tried. And the other is, I think this potentially, although it's probably suicidally risky, a direct line straight up the middle of these things. Uh, I'm not offering to do it. I'm pretty sure you're not, Nigel. Well, I'm going to say, what time do we finish? We'll get cracking if you like. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm busy that week, like the rest of my life. But, you know, there's stuff to be done. There's adventure to be had, but we have to accept that adventure, it's hard work. Yeah. You rarely want the glory of, you know, assuming you find glory in all of this, you put the work in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and adventure involves risk. That's the entire meaning of the word. It is an undergoing that involves risk. And as you say, there's so much more to this massive, massive mountain. It's not just a route that you do. And um, people have got to take their eyes off, take the blinkers off, really, and open up more. And in a generation or two's time, you know, other routes will be put up. We know that. We've seen that with climbing, Cathy, that from the 18, 1900s, that what we might now class as a reasonably simple climbing route, now we're pushing horrendous E grades on big rock. Um, and it will come. It will, you know, somebody at some point will climb them. But we've got to take those blinkers off, that one line on the mountain. Absolutely. I think the Everest story, it isn't over. It isn't over in terms of the, the problem of crowding and money and corruption. But it's absolutely not over either in terms of the challenge uh, that it can bring and the things that can be done. Yeah, yeah definitely. So I think that's us. I yeah. think very cool. Super. The intention for this, the Think Like an Explorer video blog, is that Nigel and I, with the support of Cindy, will get together roughly once every two weeks. We have too much of a chaotic schedule to guarantee exactly the same time and exactly the same time day every two weeks. Uh, we have mountains to climb and speeches to give and jobs to go to and you know bills to pay. The intention is roughly every two weeks yeah. uh, to come out with a new one of these episodes. So please follow us on Twitter if you'd like to know when the next one comes up. And we look forward to seeing you all next time.